G'day, I'm Gavin from Hurl Fly Fishing and welcome to another episode of On The Fly. We're up here in Gippsland in a magnificent little stream, just meandering through. So we're going to walk up here, I've got my trusty uh, rubber leg stimulator and that's a fly that works really well in these areas. There's going to be some caddis hatches, um, could be some grasshoppers and that's what they'll take that fly for. If it gets a bit hot, we might need to look at putting a nymph uh, underneath this as well, because sometimes the fish will be down deep. So we'll either go with the dry and a nymph underneath, or even just a, a solid nymph by itself. But we'll work our way up this lovely little stream, casting uh, to areas where the likelihood of a fish is. So it could be over there by the um, in the shadows, underneath some of these trees, where a lot of their food comes from. So uh, it'll have a new exploratory cast, and hopefully a fish likes it and comes up and takes this fly. All right, and we've had quite a few casts through that and it hasn't produced a fish. So we've got two options. We can uh, tie on a nymph underneath and drag that through, or we keep moving on. But you don't want to spend too much time in one area and we'll keep moving up because I think the fish uh, are going to come up and, and take the dry. So we'll give them another chance further up. But also when you get to a stream, you don't just willy nilly. You do it with a system attached. So we'll cast to the left hand side first and work your way along. So you're covering all the water that's available to you. So uh, work it systematically and you'll catch a lot more fish. Now this is uh, a fly box that, that I'd use in some of these small little rivers. You want a selection of flies that are gonna work. Here we've got like a, um, the rubber leg stimulators which work really well um, in, in big size, which, which when the grasshoppers are about, that's fantastic. Smaller ones in little streams, potentially smaller fish. Um, again, I really like the elk hair caddis. Um, this, rivers like these sort of ones throughout Gippsland have a lot of caddis through them, so they work really well. Um, mayflies, from time to time, a smaller fly, that works really well. And a selection of, of nymphs, just to get down there. So uh, I use a lot of tungsten beads, just helps it to sink much faster. So have a good selection of flies, and if the water's a bit dirty, the odd worm works wonders as well. So uh, a good fly box, well thought out, is going to bring you results. Now it was too hard to resist. We were going to walk past it and just continue with the dry. And the water just looks so good. You just imagine there's going to be fish through it. So uh, I couldn't help myself. I had to tie in a nymph underneath the dry. And we'll just run that through there. And fish are like Labradors. Eat as much as they can, but be as lazy as they can as well. So that's how you've got to uh, approach your fishing. Think of it as you're trying to catch a, uh, a lazy Labrador. That fish won't sit in the hard current and swim just to maintain its uh, position. He wants to sit in a nice little area, perhaps behind a rock, behind a log, where the water's deflected and food gets brought to him, like on an escalator. So we'll just run that through. And just look for likely areas. The time hit of any run is always going to be up the top of the pool. And your bigger fish is going to get first crack at the food as it comes down. So we take a lot of attention when we get to the heads of pools where a big fish is likely to sit. Now the next pool we've got, um, you need to assess it every time you get to a new bit of water. And what we'll find here, if you just look up, uh, you'll see what we refer to as a bubble line. And that's literally bubbles coming down generally in a line. 
uh, and that's where the turbulent water is because all that food is funneled to one little uh, lane. So that uh, brings all the food together and funny enough that's where the fish sit either in that bubble line or just either side to it. So that's where we're going to put a lot of our casts, right down that bubble line. You can see where that water comes, hits that little embankment there, turns up the food and the fish will be either side. But we can't just cast from here all the way up straight away. If there's a fish much closer, we'll scare it and he'll swim up and scare the other fish and the other fish and the other fish. So you must do it in stages. So as you walk, walk quite quietly, take little steps. You don't want to send waves of water up there or noise or splash. So take your time and that might take about 10 casts to get up to the, the honey spot right near the edge of that embankment. So take your time and put your cast in all the different areas, much shorter and lengthen as you go and hopefully the fish just likes it. Oh, nice fish. And he, uh, oh gee, come up and took the dry. And it is fantastic fun, I can tell you, on a lovely little light rod like this. This is our new Stalker Legend. It's a seven foot six two weight. And in water like this, it is absolutely superb. And he's a lovely little brown. And he'll, he's, oh, a great little fish and exactly where we were expecting him to be, up on that bubble line. And we'll just try and get him away from that snag. Uh, but it's fantastic fun, just on light gear. If you imagine uh, a standard sort of fly rod might be a six weight that you use in lakes and rivers. And it's for, for casting big flies, for bigger fish. Whereas in the small waters like this, you need something light like this lovely little two weight. Beautiful little fish. And I'll just get him in the net there and that's great. That's a lovely little start. We've probably only gone, you know, 25 metres and to get a lovely fish like that is just fantastic. You know, in water like this, with lovely gear, just makes it all worthwhile and all great fun. We'll get him out in a sec, but a lovely little fish. It pays too with these smaller little fish to keep them in the water as long as you can. Uh, and if you want to get a photo, all good, but you get your camera ready, get that fish out of the water, snap, snap, and get him back in. So uh, the longer the time they are out of the water, uh, the less good it does them. So, uh, yeah, we'll just get that hook out. Sorry, matey. And that catch and release tool is fantastic for literally getting that hook out without needing to touch the fish particularly on a lot of these smaller ones as well, uh, so you're not squeezing them too hard. But what we want to do is wet our hands, so even with gloves on, I find it much better, A, for sun protection, but also to uh, grab the fish as well. You don't need to squeeze him as hard. Grips really well, and uh, we'll get him out. He's going to be ready to go, because we haven't played with him too much. You know, you leave a lot of life lit in them, and they'll be happy for someone else to come and catch as well. Come on, mate. Beautiful little fish, look at that. Lovely spots. I mean, they're all beautiful in, in their own way, but you look at those red spots, and that's a brown trout. A rainbow will have uh, a, a, like a quite a, a red or pink streak line down the middle, and this is a brown, and he's gonna be good. Perfectly camouflaged in water like this, you know, that's what the, they're made for. In lovely little water like this, quite cool. They certainly enjoy it and they thrive and, and breed really well in, in waters like this that we've got you know, throughout Australia. So when you get the chance to get out and have a go at fly fishing, you know, come to places like this. You don't have to travel far, you know, like within an hour, hour and a half, two hours from Melbourne. You can get to these exceptional waterways like we've got on our doorstep uh, and really get to experience it and enjoy it. And fly fishing is one thing you're going to want to do for the rest of your life. <clears throat>
They're all nice little fish. And uh, literally in the, exactly the same spot as where we hooked the other uh, brown and a smaller fish, as you can just see in there. But still, they all count. And I keep saying sizes and everything. Normally I always use a net, but he's a relatively small little fish. And uh, we can safely handle him. Different colours uh, than the last one. He's a lot more uh, browner and still has a lot of red spots, but still a beautiful fish. And uh, we can just literally get that fly out without mucking about too much. And away he goes. And uh, he'll keep eating and just be a little bit more tentative next time he sees a little caddis fly come down. But that fish was in exactly the same spot where we hooked the other one literally minutes before. And what will happen, that might be a great feeding line, like what we said about with a bubble line. And that big fish will kick out all the smaller fish. A bit like the older brother at the dinner table, he always gets the best seat and first go up the food. Now he'll, because we've taken him out and he'll might sit under a log, that first fish for, you know, maybe half a day, a little fish goes ripper that's the best spot and he'll sit in there as well. So when you catch a fish out of a really good spot, don't then uh, neglect it. Put a few more casts in there because you never know what might turn up as we just found out there. Lovely bit of water up here with the bubble line and also some good shade. So trout like shade, just as much as humans on a hot day. Uh, sometimes you will find that the, the smaller fish, it's a very splashy rise. Like we were saying before, you might go to a, uh, an elk care caddis a bit smaller or even a, uh, a little mayfly like an Adam's parachute and they'll be able to fit that in their mouth and you'll catch them. But you can just move on because he's probably only about four or five inches anyway. So, uh, But at least it's a take and that's what we're out here to do, to, to get something that eats for a living, to take something that you've either tied yourself or bought from a good fly shop and get him to eat that thinking it's food, you've done pretty well. We do have a nice little run. It's a little bit tight, but I guess that's why we're using short little rods, seven and a half foot in a, a light little two weight is ideal. So you short cuts and it keeps that fly out of all these trees. And a short little drift like that uh, is still okay to hold fish. So uh, we'll run the fly through that a couple of times as we're getting up to some of the more open areas. Lovely little bit of water up here. I'm expecting one to come out where uh, all these rapids and the bubbles oxygenates the water. Uh, good for the trout, but also good for producing nymphs. So a lot of food is going to live in that oxygenated water as well. Uh, a little bit of sunshine, it's obviously going to see the fly. Now to get it there, again, we, we, when you're fly casting, you need as much room behind you as you do in front. Because there's this big tree here, you can't do a back cast. You're going to go uh, straight into it, tangle up, lose your flies. Which is good if you own a fly fishing shop, not so good if you've got to buy all the flies. What we need to do is a roll cast and that's all we're literally doing is we create a D with the line and do our forward cast and that literally uh, catapults the, the flies in front of you without needing a back cast. So a roll cast is actually quite easy to do uh, and once you perfect it, it's going to put that fly in front of that fish more often without the need of a back cast and losing flies. Now one thing you need to remember as well, fishing's really important, catching fish is sort of important, but you've also got to spare a bit of time to stop and have a look around. Um, and from even just the lovely ferns you've got on the side of the bank up to these probably 15, 20 foot tree ferns are just stunning. The canopy that that uh, produces is incredible. All the way up to these massive gums that, who knows, you know, 50, 100 foot tall, 
Uh, just a lovely country we've got. And we've just got to make sure that we do every now and then just stop, have a look around and appreciate how lucky we are to spend time in a place like this. Oh, nice little fit. And uh, a little bit different. It was a lovely little spot that we were just expecting a fish to be. And uh, this one we've got on the nymph. So it pays to uh, have that dry and nymph cocktail at times, because that's brought this fish undone. He might be happily feeding with plenty of nymphs, and there is always going to be more food under the surface than on top. And trout uh, will do whatever it takes to, to get their next meal. So he might be happily eating nymphs, and you could throw every dry you've got and he's not even looking up. So uh, to have that nymph underneath that dry certainly produce the goods on this fish and who knows what's up above it. But uh, have a couple of goes at different options until one works and then keep doing that. Beautiful little fish. Just get that nymph out there. Uh, and I'll get you a quick look at him without keeping him out of the water too much. But just great fun. On a fly rod, any fish is good, even uh, small ones. Because we've done so much right to get him to take. And he's a beautiful little fish. You just see him glisten in the sun. Lovely little red dots on that. And a great wild trout. And we just want to hold him in the current and he'll swim out pretty quickly once he gets his uh, uh, little bit of life back in him. And that's just great fun. Now we get a lot of people asked, you know, like how do we get into fly fishing? You know, be, you know, it's a, a, it's a bit of an art to learn the cast at the start, and then it's a little bit of stream craft as well. Often it's just time on the water, but it pays to get someone to show you how to do it properly at the start, rather than literally wasting a few years doing it wrong. Uh, you, we do courses, which is a good way to learn, you know, in half a day what might take you a couple of years on your own. Other than that, there's fly fishing clubs, you know, in various states throughout Australia where you can go there. They often teach casting, uh, fly tying, and teach you the know-how to catch fish. So that's a good option as well. Get an expert to show you how to do it properly, and you're going to be successful for the rest of your life. So uh, when I talk about a dry and a nymph, I probably should explain it a bit better. So I've got a rubber leg roll stimulator as the top fly and works as a, um, a fly that they'll eat, also as an indicator. And that literally indicates to me when about three foot below I've got a nymph, when that gets eaten by a fish. It'll pull that dry under, you strike and away you go. Fairly simple. There are times where you might want to get it deeper. And if you need to get it deeper than three or four foot, then you really need um, an actual floating indicator and maybe allow like six to eight feet uh, of, of tippet before you fly, allow it to get down. But for lovely little rivers like this, or when the fish are very active, a dropper, two or three feet, uh, under a lovely dry is all you need. We've got a lovely little pool here. We've got uh, little rapids, again, oxygenated. We've got shade, so the water's not too hot. Depth, so they're quite confident if something's going to attack them, be it a cormorant or a cagey old fly fisherman. And a bubble line that I always speak about. So it's got everything going for it if you're a trout and everything going for it if you're a fly fisherman. So we're going to just drift a few down on the bubble line there. 
And if we don't get a fish out of this, I think we're gonna have a, uh, a Royal Commission into why not. There, oh, there you go. And uh, it was exactly where you'd expect a fish to be. Lovely little, little brown. And that's ideal. And it really is just lovely water. And I think that's the beauty of fly fishing. I'll just uh, get him off. He's just a small little fish. So if you want to uh, catch big fish, make sure you put the smaller fish back. And that's the only way it's going to happen. But a lovely little water. And as a fly fisherman, that's what we're doing. We're learning what water produces fish, where that fish is likely going to be, what fly do I need to catch him. Uh, and then you've obviously practiced your casting and you put it all into play and when it works out it's just fantastic so um, hmm, pretty good way to spend a day surroundings blue sky day and I'm not at work all pretty good going beautiful little run here spread out through this whole pool So start off at the, the bank closest to you. Pass in there, because it could well hold it. But where I'm probably more excited to cast is over to the left side, where a little bit more depth and a bit of current as well. There we go. Oh, we're just about to uh, give up. <coughs> and uh, there was one, I'd just taken that uh, nymph and we fished it pretty thoroughly. And uh, yeah, just that, that cast, he thought it was all right. But a lovely little fish, again a brown, and took that nymph. Just a beautiful little fish, even at that size. They're, uh, oh, just, you can go, mate. They're great fun as well. So uh, just persist. Even when you're about to give up, you're only one cast away from that fish taking that fly, and it makes it worthwhile. Well, that's all we've got time for in today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it's a fantastic stream in uh, Gippsland, and there's loads of them around that are literally stacked full of trout. So if you get the chance, get up here and put a fly on the water. You're going to have a great time. So I look forward to catching you on the fly.